across Wisconsin from Civic Media. This is Up North News Radio. Now, live from our Lake Wissota studio, here's the founding editor of Up North News, Pat Brightlow. Hey there, Wisconsin. Good morning. It is 6.06 on this Friday morning, April 19th, 2024. It is another beautiful day to have you here up north. Live from Lake Wissota, from wherever you're listening, across the Civic Media Radio Network, through the app, through social media, by podcast. Nice to have you along on this Friday morning, where you can join us, as always, at 855-75-CIVIC. It's 855-75-CIVIC. You can call it, you can text it, you can also email us, radio at upnorthnewswi.com, or put a comment on Facebook. We would love to hear from you, um, either by phone or by text, just uh, shooting us a note saying what it's like where you are, where are you, what are you up to this weekend? You know, something we ask Greg Bach every Friday about the Laughing Tap. We'll do that in just a second. First, uh, you you mad bro, <laughs> seems like a good title, and Greg loves when I try to sound street. Um, the, the folks who ter- termed the coin, term. now I got to bring Greg in so he can mock me on this. People who coined the term You're doing snowflake. great. You're doing great. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just give me a little bit more rope. I'll be just fine. I'm fine. All right. Okay. The- just trying to be here as a, as a friend, <laughs> you know, confidant and someone supporting you. But I appreciate that. All right. Shall we do it again? Yes. Take two. The, pe- the people who coined the term snowflake sure are quick to have a meltdown when you call attention to their actual record. We will look at Eric Hovde's attempt to again deny his own words about nursing home residents, their pending death, and voting. Uh, There was also some mock indignation from legislators who turned out to be at a fundraiser in Washington, D.C. instead of trying to find a way to clean up contaminated water in Wisconsin. Uh, We'll talk to uh, Kia Vakil, Korea Newsroom National Correspondent, about the Trump trial this week. We'll talk to Mark Jacobs about media coverage of it, and we'll talk to former U.S. Attorney Jim Santel in our second hour about the historic trial. And meanwhile, while Trump is on trial, President Biden is on the campaign trail, and so we'll uh, hear what Mark and Kia have to say about this week's events. Dan Schumacher will talk sports with us. Brittany Merlot will have the forecast. And right now, we've got temperatures at 6 a.m. across Wisconsin on this Friday that go like so. Uh, Lake Wissota here, we're at 36 degrees. Uh, then the rest of the state, kind of left to right, top to bottom. Hayward's at 32, Park Falls 31, Wausau 34, Green Bay 38. And then we head down to La Crosse 37, in Rapids it's 34, Oshkosh 38. Down to Madison it's 36, and it's 36 in Waukesha, where we find... Oh, wait, I introduced him already. Hi, Greg, how are you? <laughs> Hi, everybody, I'm Greg Park. So, um... Yeah. Did you listen to anything good on the radio yesterday besides, you know, the, the shows that you do? Did did I get an earworm stuck in your head by chance yesterday? No, I, I, that kind of stuff doesn't happen to me. I mean, just, <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about, Pat. I just know that I, when I drive home, it's a nice, relaxing, soothing decompression. I am, I am the lineman for, for the, the county. county. God, this is like a beer commercial. I love you, man. I love you. We're bonding as we sing Glenn Campbell My together. dad was the lineman. <laughs> it's still a great song. I told Pat, I listened to this song no less than 20 times yesterday. I didn't do that yesterday, but I there have been times where I've played it like, you know, maybe five times. And just like, yeah. I just love this song. And yeah. there it is again. So yeah. you can, you can keep your Taylor Swift. We've got Glenn Campbell. Oh, I'm That's keeping my we... Taylor Swift too. She's released a new record today. Oh my goodness. I saw, yeah. um, look on, on social media, the, I don't have a lot of Swifties on there, but, uh, <laughs> journal Sentinel reporter, Jesse O'Poin has to be one of the most prominent Swifties, uh, in Wisconsin media. And apparently was, it was a big deal that what's it called the tortured poets department? Correct. I uh, just it just I kept saying TPPD everywhere. Yep. That was one of the hashtags. But apparently, secretly, she dropped a second album. Apparently, it's, it's a double album with fifteen more songs that she wrote. So, yeah, what, that's, what that's you what just heard us when... doing about Glenn Campbell, other people are doing about Taylor Swift. <laughs> I right mean, now. while. 
and and Swifties come at me because this is the, this is just the truth. When you look at like a, an artist like Beyonce or Taylor Swift, I love the amount of for the, as big as they are, they could put out a record every five years and people would be happy because that's kind of what like bigger, just not just musicians but like icon entertainers do. Like they got a lot of things going on, they don't have time to record. It. But like you look at it, someone like a Glenn Campbell or a Merle Haggard, it's like oh he released forty records in three years. Oh my goodness, yes. I mean. <laughs> The output was insane. Yeah. Uh, but you were always trying to feed, you know, top 40 radio or yep. top country radio uh, and always looking for that next that next single. So, you know, two different eras, but in both cases, you, you like the output. I mean, I don't know. I can't conceive of coming up with 15 more songs for a Tortured Poets album, but uh, apparently uh, Tay-Tay said in, in releasing it that there were these things that she just couldn't get out of her head and she finally had to get them out. <laughs> Which takes me to somebody else who's got a lot of things in his head that he's got to get out. Uh, do you remember Tim Rantham, the former yes. assembly rep yes. who ran for governor? Yep. S special fella. He was kind of our version of the the My Pillow guy. Um, <laughs> big time election denier. Uh, made an unsuccessful run for governor, which was rooted in the effort to somehow have Wisconsin revoke its electoral votes for President Biden which is not a thing. Anyway, he, he fell short in that run for governor, and now he's back on the public stage uh, running for office with this doozy of a campaign announcement, which I'm going to provide a dramatic reading of. Oh, uh, man. Here we go. Oh, she got dramatic music. Yep, Tim Rantham, uh, campaign announcement from yesterday. The voice of the people supporting me in public service has not faded. Of late, their wishes came true through the modification of Wisconsin's legislative maps. Uh, Rantham then goes on to explain the new maps sometimes create party primaries, but he's not afraid of that. He writes, A multitude of expressions statewide, concentrated primarily within my residential area central to the 20th Senate District, demanded my re-engagement of, by, and for the people, has been overwhelming. Given that the voice of the people is the voice of God, their wishes have touched my heart. As such, with thoughtful discussion and deep prayer, it became crystal clear that action was required to that end. I humbly announce my candidacy, Rantham says, for Wisconsin's new 20th Senate District. He describes the sprawly new Senate District as, quote, a large area of citizenry seeking the capabilities and attitude about service that I know I possess and have proven with multiple levels in the public service arena. He then lists some of these qualities in all capital letters. He is a self-described constitutional conservative, Christian values, principal conviction, fearless courage, fearless courage, unbridled passion to serve, exceptional communication and service skills, leadership skills, that never waver to the status quo, a fighter for results, a public servant who embraces servanthood entrusted upon me by those I serve, I do so look forward to meeting and exceeding your expectations. And I read that and I read it again and I thought, where have I heard this style of speech before? And it occurs to me, it was Harvey Corman as Hedley Lamar in the movie <laughs> Blazing Saddles. Hit it, Hedley. Rockreek, Rockreek, be still, Taggart, be still. Yes, sir. My mind is aglow with whirling transient nodes of thought, careening through a cosmic vapor of invention. Ditto. <laughs> Ditto? Ditto, you provincial putz. Oh. <laughs> and... Never, you're not going to hear another dramatic reading of a campaign announcement quite like that one. I, I'm running for office because they didn't want me as governor, and I guess this will do. And, and to, to get there, he's going to have to uh, unseat a current Republican state senator who got drawn into his district, Senator Dan Fayen from Fond du Lac. So they will face off in the August 13th primary, and then we'll, we, we have that whole thing to... To look forward to. But. I can't believe I'm about to say this, but poor Dan Fayan. You know, it's like it's like, man, I just really, dude. 
<laughs> can't have yes. this, can I? All right, cool deal, yep. bro. See you at the debates. It's going to be weird. You you get Rantham, and good luck on that. Hey, by the way, on the subject of election deniers, um, just one other quick headline to pass along on that front. A top official with the conservative group Turning Point Action has resigned in Arizona amid accusations of forging signatures on the paperwork that would let him get on the ballot to run for a seat in the Arizona legislature. Which is why I say again, everything from this group is either a projection or a confession. It just happens all the time. And so now we've got Tim Rantham running. Uh, again, I'm sure still on election deniability yeah. is what he's going to give us. And I thought we were done with that. I hope he does the same thing that Van Wangard and Eric Hovde did, which is, no, the 2020 election is over and I want to move on. But if I <laughs> but, have to talk about it, I have some thoughts. I have, <laughs> I have this legal pad full of yeah. things. Eric Hovde is still mad, still mad that, that he – that he said what he said and that people yeah. are daring to share his words. He, he posted uh, yesterday, we've all heard of liberal media bias and we know it exists, but how does it work? What's the anatomy of a liberal hit job? It's really pretty simple, but it can trick you if you're not paying attention. And through a series of tweets, he talks about the out of context quote, the liberal smear, the weaponizing of the lie. But here's the thing. There was no out of context quote. There was the quote. There was the quote that said what it said. You said what you said. Yeah. Which was, you know, you're only going to live five or six months. The life expectancy in a nursing home is five or six months. There were people that did not appreciate hearing that, that maybe we shouldn't be helping nursing home residents to vote. And yeah, he was also trying to make the point that there may be something fraudulent going on, again, without any proof whatsoever. Yeah. And but if you want that, I have that quote. You can play it anytime you want. It's loaded let's, up and ready. Let's hear the actual words. Of Eric Hubbard. I'm not going to spend my time talking about 2020. <laughs> that again. Uh, do oh, I believe the election was stolen? No, but did things happen in that election that were very troublesome? Absolutely. And I can point them out right here in Wisconsin. We had Zuckerbucks come into uh, Democratic cities in a big way to push out, working with cities to push out Democratic votes. We had nursing homes where the sheriff of Racine investigated where you had 100 percent voting in nursing homes. Well, if you're in a nursing home, you only have five, six month life expectancy. Almost nobody in a nursing home is in a point to vote. There it is. Almost nobody in a nursing home is in a point to vote. You're just 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 gum your pudding or whatever because you, you're a vegetable and, you know, don't take part in democracy. Yeah, there's, there was nothing out of con. You said what you said. Then there's what Derek Van Orden said. We're getting to that next on this Friday morning. You're up north. Sunday marks the eighth anniversary of the passing of Prince, and so we're going to play a, a little bit from uh, Paisley Park uh, throughout the morning here. But we will not, of course, forget uh, the passing of Dickie Betts from the Allman Brothers Band. We'll get to that in today's history lesson in just a sec. Um, and while we're still on musical notes here, uh, do you remember, Greg, how CBS kind of dumped out of the uh, Billy Joel Madison Square Garden concert thing the other day a little bit early. It was all the, the rage and the anger and the people and the stuffings and yeah, they, they, that was a smart move. I I, I wonder <laughs> <laughs> looking for a new job somebody is I bet. Nope, because they're making good on it tonight. Oh. Tonight they're replaying the Madison Square Garden hundredth concert by Billy Joel. So, just wanted to make note of that. If you if you need to catch it, if you need to set your DVR because you didn't hear Billy Joel the last three thousand times that you put a CD in, <laughs> like I do, right. uh, but it's there. It's a it, it was a it was a good show. Um, maybe you're not watching TV at home on a Friday night. Maybe you're out and about. Maybe you'd like to to engage in a little ha ha. There's a there's a place in Milwaukee that does this. I mean, their ha ha's are on tap. One would say, Greg. All right, I can you're only hired. put the ball on the T so right, you, well for no, you. you. You're hired. You Hype work for the, man. You work for the marketing department now. Good job. No. Um, What's happening at the Laughing Tap, Greg? Well, as usual, we have three shows tonight, 7.30, tomorrow, 7.30 at 10 o'clock with the ever-lovable and wonderful C.J. Sullivan. He is a Los Angeles comic who actually started here in the Midwest, started in Chicago, 
And he has been on Comedy Central, and he has been he has written for NBC, A and E, A and E Kids. Ask your grandparents. Um, <laughs> Comedy Central and Robert Smigel. And if you know anything about uh, comedy, you oh. know Robert Smigel in the world of comedy writing is a legend, a god, a man mm-hmm. atop. Probably on the, you know, the modern. If there's a modern Mount Rushmore of comedy writers, he's on it. Oh yeah, uh, just very very funny, very fun and he will be here for three shows tickets are 22 dollars online laughingtap.com 25 dollars at the door and remember no drink minimums so it is an affordable night of ha-ha's ha-ha i see not a ha that was an aha as opposed to a mwahaha. Uh, in sports, the Brewers were uh, off yesterday, heading to St. Louis. They open up a three-game series against the Cardinals uh, over the weekend, and then they're going to head to Pittsburgh for some more division action. But as for the uh, kickoff of the series, first pitch tonight, uh, 7-10 it must be, because the pregame starts at 640, and you can catch Brewers baseball with the pregame starting at 640 on News from the Center in Richland Center, WRJN in Racine, Oshkosh Air Support, and 98Q Country in Park Falls. Meanwhile, the Milwaukee Bucks will finally open their playoff journey on Sunday, playing the Indiana Pacers. For uh, Sunday's game, the pregame starts at 5.30 on Oshkosh Air Support, News from the Center in Richland Center, Lake Air in Amory, WRJN in Racine, 98Q Country in Park Falls, and locally grown radio in Wisconsin Rapids. And if you weren't, you know, handy with a, a pen and paper and couldn't take all that down, uh, head over to civicmedia.us. Learn more about the stations, more about the shows, which ones uh, cover sports. And while you're at it, download the Civic Media app because then you can take us on the road. Uh, you can listen live through, you know, your, your car speaker, through Bluetooth or through a connection. Uh, all of these things available to you through the app. Head over to wherever you get your apps or civicmedia.us. All right, I'm calling up uh, the Friday morning daily newsletter from Up North News that Christina Laurie puts together. And she, see, let's see, let's see. She says, the Dane County Farmer's Market gets all the hype, but there's another farmer's market in that part of the state that routinely tops national rankings. And she's talking about the Beloit Farmer's Market, which apparently is very highly rated uh, through online. And uh, there's also a, a link to a list of America's top 10 farmer's markets But frankly, again, pretty much anywhere in Wisconsin, you're never that far from a farmer's market. Uh, Get out there and enjoy some of what is uh, produced out here all throughout the spring and summer. Uh, There's also an article from yours truly on what Wisconsin lawmakers got done before adjourning on a 10-month paid vacation. So again, head over to upnorthnewswi.com, click on newsletter in the top banner, and... uh, Get yourself subscribed to our newsletter. All right. I promised you that uh, Derek Van Orden, we have to reset the board. There, There is a, a, a mythical scoreboard someplace that says uh, Wisconsin has gone blank number of days without Derek Van Orden embarrassing us, and we have to reset the board to zero because the congressman from the 3rd District uh, has again made national headlines for another angry outburst, this one on the floor of the U.S. House of Representatives. What's different this time is the target. He's not yelling at a young library worker. He's not yelling at young Senate pages. He's not yelling at experts giving him a briefing on national security. Nope. This time, it's his own people. Uh, at first, the Capitol correspondents you know, in, in the press gallery thought that he was yelling at House Speaker Mike Johnson. But it turns out Van Orden saw that other right-wingers were berating Speaker Johnson. So he went over and berated them and and said that they are this small faction of extremists is essentially hijacking the rest of House Republicans. At one point, uh, Florida Congressman and future inmate Matt Gates uh, called Van Orden a squish. Van Orden thought that that meant he was calling him fat, so he responded by calling Matt Gates tubby. And that's what got reported throughout the press. Uh, not sure if he was yelling at Johnson or Gates. It later turned out it was Gates. And I'm sure it was explained later 
to Derek Van Orden that squish in that context was not about his waistline. It was Gates accusing Van Orden of not being MAGA enough. But again, our great thanks to Congressman Derek Van Orden for helping show off what passes for decorum these days in the one ring circus that is the Republican House majority. Did I see correctly uh, that Aaron Rodgers has uh, again been repeating some kind of a conspiracy theory uh, regarding, I mean, it, it dates back to like the, the 1980s. Um, it, it conflates some old stories with new stories about the vaccine. Uh, I, I made a note to look for it, and I didn't know if you'd already heard about it or not, Greg. We talked about it on the show, on uh, Matt and Aaron Air a couple of days ago. Uh, okay. Now he is saying that the government Here. created AIDS. The was, government created AIDS. And it, what he's really trying to do is he he's really just trying to tie that now to Fauci because Fauci, of course, worked for the government back in those days as well. Mm-hmm. And he said uh, the blueprint, the game plan was made in the 80s to create a pandemic with a virus that goes wild. That's, that's you know, that's how doctors for, uh, described AIDS back in the day. It was killing Thousands of people. It's going wild. It's, yeah. um, so, and his whole thing is like, oh, first it was AZT, and now it's this drug. It's like, yeah, because medicine, because science advances, evolves, you learn things. and we make yes. new things. You mm-hmm. absolute moron. Yeah, uh, I am just. I, I saw that and I thought, no, do we again? And yeah, he, because he keeps getting a stage for this. And so, of course, you know, he's not the only one. You've got presidential candidate Robert Kennedy Jr. who's talking along these, you know, conspiratorial lines. And did you see that the entire, I mean, entire Kennedy family has now endorsed Joe Biden? Oh, yeah. Yep. Ra- rather than their own member. Yep. Uh, and I think we're understanding why more and more yep. each day. Kia Vakil coming up next. You're up north. Where we go. We're back now on Up North News Radio with Courier Newsroom National Correspondent Kia Vakil. Kia, good morning. Good morning, Pat. Hey, uh, let's. We've got two uh, two presidential candidates. One on trial, one on the trail. <laughs> see, see what I did there? Uh, let's start with the guy on trial first. A, a very yeah. historic <laughs> week in terms of uh, jury selection beginning and Donald Trump's first criminal trial, and. The jury selection thing got got off to a bit of a slow start, then it picked up, and now I'm starting to have some concerns about this jury. What what were your impressions of the first week's events? Yeah, I mean, it's understandably quite difficult to find jurors who don't already have a pretty formed opinion of Donald Trump. Uh, He's not exactly someone who flies under the radar, Um, so it was always going to be difficult. now, layer in the fact that, you know, you have an entire media apparatus on the right that seems hell bent on really making any person who serves on this jury's life miserable, um, you know, and I it's, it's just been a mess. So we were up to seven jurors selected um, uh, by Wednesday and then Thursday morning, two of them were dismissed. Um, and so you know, we're currently at five, uh, you know, that number will increase obviously, but you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it, it but, just speaks to the challenge of prosecuting Donald Trump because he's well, going to, especially, pre- especially like you said, though, with this, this right wing media yep. system here and look, I'm, people are going to say, uh Oh, here, what's this with a, a guy in media saying, you know, that, that courts ought to go after the media. Look, if you're Fox News, of course, in quotation marks, and you're all but giving the name of one of the jurors, uh, I don't really know how the judge in that case doesn't try to do something. Maybe the only option is to sequester the jury. But again, we're not at that point yet. We're at the point of of Trump friendly media outlets trying to identify them in a way to intimidate them or get them to to pull themselves off the jury that maybe it's an isolated thing but god kia that just it it just looked so bad yeah and 
we should also be clear. It's not, you know, Fox News and the right are the ones, you know, using this information to try to interfere with this case. But we saw a lot. We saw the New York Times identify a lot of pretty specific details about some yes. of these. And so, you know, which raises a question of, you know, what what are what are what are report like this is a really a question of media ethics. Like what is it actually important to, you know, convey information about who juror number four is like mm-hmm. if it could put them at, in danger or at risk of harassment? Uh, I would vote no. But, you know, the folks at The New York Times and some other outlets out there might feel differently. And, you know, I do worry that, you know, we are they are revealing so many specific details that it will not take very long for folks on the Internet to identify these folks and harass them. And so there really is, you know, something to be said about, you know, trying to maintain anonymity for these jurors, because we know what Trump's base does. They did January 6th. They target judges. They target Democrats. They target Republicans sometimes. So um, re- reporters really ought to be careful here. Uh, without a doubt. And again, the 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 freedom of the press and the freedom of speech does not mean you can't occasionally police yourself and engage in responsible actions. I will certainly be asking Mark Jacob about this in our next hour as well, because better better to self-police then yeah. again to have you know courts or, or somebody do it for you but let's look ahead here uh, at the time when when you know the first seven jurors were picked the yeah. judge was saying you know opening arguments could begin as as soon as uh, this coming monday my question isn't so much about that it, it, it's going to it's going to happen my question is will it take opening arguments for the former president to stop you know getting drowsy when these things are happening uh, again, I'm a, I'm a little surprised that, um, you know, the, the judge didn't call this out more than you know members of the media did. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't know. This is Trump is a guy with a famously short attention span who really has an obsessive need to be in control and be controlling the dynamic of whatever environment he's in. So this is very much new to him. He is not used to being at the whims of the criminal justice system, having to follow orders from a judge. Um, so he like clearly struggling to stay awake, struggling to remain interested. Um, and so I, I don't know. Uh, I would hope that, you know, at some point he is able to remain awake and alert. But, you know, the trial will proceed regardless. So. This has to be the longest, though, that he's ever had to just sit still and listen because he was famous during his presidency for not wanting briefings. And he'd interrupt the, the briefers all the time. And here yep. he can't do any of those things. So I I bring this all up to say that not just the drowsiness, but he, he did get chided once for, for murmuring or muttering or something like that, that I think, I think even with the opening arguments from, you know, from the, uh, the government attorney, you know, from the state's attorney there, uh, I don't know that the guy's going to be able to help himself. And so I, I think we're going to be talking about this a week from now as, as well. Uh, we're not, I don't think a week from now we're going to be saying, wow, he really just sat there and, and paid close attention and everything. That's I don't think that trial, this trial was ever had a prayer of sounding like that. No, definitely not. Uh, this is also this sort of situation. And there could be four trials this year are right. seem specifically designed to be Donald Trump's hell of just sitting and listening to other people talk and not being really able to talk himself. Um but he is definitely going to interrupt. He's going to say some stuff. It's not going to be like he's not going to behave well. He has never done that a day in his life. No. So we'll uh, we'll follow that as we head into the new week and see if the opening arguments take place or not. So from uh, Trump on trial to Biden on the trail, you get to spend uh, some time in Pennsylvania. Uh, tell us some of the, the themes that he's been hitting this week. Yeah. So uh, Biden uh, did a three-stop tour through Pennsylvania this week where he was in Scranton, uh, you know, famously, which is, you know, where he grew up, um, and then uh, Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. Um, really focused, he really focused on, you know, economic and tax policy and, you know, making, you know, talk, like letting voters know that, you know, this year is going to be a choice between, you know, the way he put it was Scranton values or Mar-a-Lago values. Um, you know, the president, President Biden has passed a whole suite of legislation over the past, you know, three, four years that has, you know, lowered healthcare premiums for people who get uh, marketplace insurance. Uh, it's lowered insulin costs. Um, it's, you know, 
funded the IRS to go over after wealthy tax, you know, cheats. Um, you know, in contrast, during Trump's term, his big, you know, accomplishment, quote unquote, was his tax cut, which mostly helped corporations and the wealthy. And so this is the message Biden is talking about on the trail. Um, he's really trying to draw a contrast between the two on the economy. And then, you know, we also saw him, uh, he's going to put in, he's been putting, he announced more tariffs on Chinese steel and aluminum imports while in Pennsylvania. Um, and this is also, you know, a big, that's a big deal in Pennsylvania. It's a big deal elsewhere. Um, it's an effort to sort of prevent just a glut of Chinese steel and aluminum being dumped on the U.S., which, you know, obviously harms U.S. steel makers and U.S. steel workers. And I think uh, as well, trying to, again, make the case to, uh, you know, middle class families, working families, families that have anything to do with manufacturing, for example, that uh, the president was looking to make a distinction uh, on his values toward workers, talking about picket lines and things like that, versus Trump's record on workers, which, uh, you know, one of your colleagues had a story about that this week. Yeah, I mean, we've seen Trump pretty cynically try to completely reframe his record. And he's been doing this for years, to be clear. He's tried to position himself as, you know, a fighter for the working class. Um, and with, unfortunately, with some success there, a lot of voters do think he's more about workers. Um, but, you know, this is a guy whose labor department uh, made it harder for eight, uh, I believe it was 8 million workers to get overtime pay. They lost eligibility. Um, this was a guy who blocked the raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour. He rolled back rules that, you know, basically would have, he, he implemented changes that made it easier to award federal contracts to companies that repeatedly viol, violated sexual harassment laws, racial discrimination laws, wage laws. Um, you know, he, it, it just doesn't stop. He promised he would protect jobs in Lordstown, Ohio, um, but that GM plant, you know, shut down. Um, he said he would rene renegotiate a better NAFTA. Uh, that did not exactly happen. He's attacked unions. Um, he made it easier to offshore. It just goes on and on and on. Um, and, you know, we can't expect voters to know every single policy that someone's done. That's not I don't know every single policy everyone's done. But, you know, when you actually look at any semblance of his record, it's none of it is pro worker, not a single thing. Uh, which now just takes me over to, to Florida when you talk about workers. And we're going to go to one of the guys who had hoped to be the Republican nominee, the alternative to Trump, and that would be Ron DeSantis. And boy, when you think about anti-worker moves by politicians, it's hard to top, top this one, Kia, where in Florida, it's it's now, is it illegal to, for, for what, for local governments to mandate water breaks for, for workers? When water outside? breaks? And heat breaks. Um, and heat breaks. So, you know, in Florida, Florida. In Florida, famously very humid, can be very warm. Uh, summers there can be pretty rough. Um, Florida is a big state. It has a lot of folks who work outdoors, whether in construction, agriculture, tourism. And, you know, the state government is obviously deeply conservative, but they're not only, you know, not require they're not only not helping workers they are making it impossible for local governments to pass legislation or ordinances that require companies to give their workers heat and water breaks so that you know they don't die um, we've seen workers die from extreme heat from dehydration we've seen workers just get really sick and we've it's just we know and we know with climate change getting worse that these sorts of breaks can be the difference between life and death and so to see a quote unquote pro worker candidate like DeSantis, you know, crack down on local government's abilities to help workers is, you know, really gives the game away. Uh, Kia, there's there's, you know, this uh, running joke that uh, well, it's become a running joke here in Wisconsin about how for years and years, uh, Republicans, when they weren't in power, were like, well, we're we're the party of local government. We're the party of local control. And then as soon as they got into office, they couldn't work fast enough, this legislature, over the years to over and over again, um, basically veto any local government initiative to have a better minimum wage or, uh, you know, some of the other things that they could have uh, mandated. And they said, oh, no, we at the state government know best. But I never thought I'd see it happening with water and heat breaks for workers outside, again, to say to a local unit of government, no, 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 the state government knows what's best. Uh, it's just stunning to see what 
what the party once said versus what the party stands for now that they're in charge of state government. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not I have not read what their explanation or justification is. I'm not sure that there's any that would make sense. Um, you know, whether it's but, you know, at the end of the day, this is a government that's obsessed with wokeness. It's that's obsessed with taking away people's rights to abortion that won't expand Medicaid that, you know, is refusing federal dollars to feed kids like it's just they're not interested in actually improving or protecting people's lives. It's just it's just nonsense. Uh, meanwhile, in the case, getting back to the Biden administration of, of somebody that does want to do that, uh, there's been has there there's been some new movement on student loans. I know the president came to Wisconsin last week to talk a bit about student loan debt. Yeah. So uh, the administration last week announced it was canceling, uh, you know, nearly student debt for nearly 300,000 more borrowers across the country. Um, and these are, you know, a combination of folks who've been making payments uh, for 10 years um, but still had debt and, you know, only took out, you know, under 12 grand. It's people who've been in, uh, you know, uh, you know, working in public service for a decade, uh, such as firefighters, teachers, police officers who are now eligible for forgiveness under a, a repayment program. Um, and this is just the latest, you know, effort from the administration to, you know, cancel student debt um, in sort of a piecemeal fashion since the Supreme Court blocked the more wide ranging plan. Um and we know what student debt does. It prevents people from starting businesses, prevents people from having families, from buying homes. Um, and the cost of college has just spiraled out of control to the place where some people spend close to six figures a year just to get a college degree. And that's obviously an extreme, but plenty of people are taking out 20, 30, 40, 50 grand in debt and struggling to repay it. And we have an administration now that for the first time in decades is actually concerned about it. All right, real quick for the weekend, game one of these series, who are you watching more, Sixers-Knicks or Lakers-Nuggets? Ooh, uh, probably Sixers-Knicks. I kind of thought so. How, how do you think your Sixers are going to do? Oh, they're going to get clobbered, but uh, hopefully it'll be entertaining. <laughs> Kia Vakil, thank you so much. Have a great weekend. You too. More after this. You're up now. There's a reason why we like when you listen to civic media through its many fine radio stations around Wisconsin. But if you do get a chance to watch us on social media, you'd be able to see things like perhaps the best lip syncing impression of Prince singing Kiss that you'll see this morning between six and seven o'clock in the morning. Uh, Prince top charts with Kiss on this day in 1986. And Sunday marks eight years uh, since his passing. So that was and one tribute. when I saw it. I was like, "No, they're wrong." Yep. I, this was during our, our time living down in Grand Cayman. Yeah. I was uh, I was the news reader on their morning show on Cayman Twenty Seven, and so I was the one that had to break the news to the the co hosts and to the listeners or to oh, the viewers rather that gosh. Prince had passed away. And we were just we were all dumbfounded. We're just like, "No, that that can't be." And sadly, it was. Uh, but we, as we've done in the past, we have to have a little fun with the song because, of course, it's it's a classic. Yeah. By Prince, but somebody else made it a classic as well. So, in tribute, we offer up the version of "Kiss" done by the one, the only, Tom Jones. You don't have to be rich to be my girl. You don't have to be good to rule my world. Ain't no particular sign. This video is ridiculous. <laughs> Say it, Tom. Think a better dance now. Yeah. <laughs> I will say about the Prince version, it's the one where, like, no matter how good of a singer you may or may not be, you're always like, you're like, I be, I to be, I to be. <laughs> there. I mean, those are voices that I don't try to be Tom Jones. Although, not to say I haven't tried to sing. It's not unusual a few times, but you know. <laughs> People like that can hit the notes for Heck a yeah. reason. Heck yeah. So that was T Tom Jones and the Art of Noise. I f uh, forget when. I think that was a year or two after it was originally hit. Uh, by the way, Kiss was number one on the charts this day in 1986. The number two song on the charts, Manic Monday by the Bangles. Also, 
written by Prince. Mm-hmm. The number one song this day in 1980 was by Blondie. American Gigolo, again, number one this day in 1980. On the birthday list, Simon Powell from uh, American Idol, 72 years old today. And now what's, what? what's the one he's on? America's Got Talent. Yeah. 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 But um, And then Ashley Judd, 56 today. Actress Kate Hudson, 45. Uh, actor Hayden Christensen is 43. Perhaps best known as plain Anakin Skywalker. The number one hit this day in 1974 was by the group MFSB. Their song was T-S-O-P. T-S-O-P was the sound of Philadelphia and the group. The acronym stood for Mother, Father, Sister, Brother. But again, just a a song that was everywhere throughout the mid-70s. On this day in 1775, the Revolutionary War began with an American victory in Concord during the battles of Lexington and Concord. The Simpsons first appeared on this day in 1987 as a series of shorts on The Tracy Ullman Show. I loved The Tracy Ullman Show. Tracy Ullman Tracy does Ullman. not get the credit for being as amazing as she is and how influential she is as a sketch comedy actor. I mean, 100%. she's so funny. 100% agree. Uh, loved that show. Love her. On this day in 2005, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger was elected to the papacy and became Pope Benedict the Sixteenth. And we can't let the, uh, the day leave if we're going to talk about, we've talked about, um, you know, guitar legends of, of rock and roll uh, with Prince. We've talked about uh, Glenn Campbell earlier in his guitar playing, but you have to note the passing of Dickie Betts uh, at the age of 80. We're just going to let this play underneath while I read uh, from the New York Times obituary. Dickie Betts, fiery guitarist with the Allman Brothers Band, dies at 80 from cancer and COPD. He traded licks they write with Dwayne Allman and proved to be a worthy sparring partner. He also wrote and sang the band's biggest hit, Ramblin' Man. Uh, Despite not being an actual Allman brother, uh, the band, founded in 1969, was led by Dwayne Allman, who achieved guitar god status before he died in a motorcycle accident at age 24, and Greg Allman, the lead vocalist, who was married to Cher in the mid-70s, Uh, Mr. Betts was a guiding force in the group for decades and central to the sound that came to define Southern rock. With his chiseled features, his Wild West mustache and gunfighter demeanor, Mr. Betts certainly looked the part of the star and he played like one. Nowhere was that more apparent than on the band's landmark 1971 live double album at Fillmore East, featuring guitar interplay with Dwayne Allman that one critic wrote resembles Miles Davis's then new electric bands, organ and guitar oozing into one another like melting butter and chocolate. Said Dwayne Allman at one point, I'm the famous guitar player, but Dickie is the good one. Dickie Betts passing away at the age of 80. Uh, We visited Capricorn Studios in Macon, Georgia, where uh, the Allman Brothers recorded a lot of records. And uh, that spirit's alive there. That, that feeling, that, that history is really, really prevalent in that space. Uh, I, I believe it. I, and I, again, you know, the, the uh, was it the Righteous Brothers that got, you know, the, the rock and roll heaven? That was them, their, their song? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And if there is, they, you know, they've got a hell of a band. Yeah. It just keeps getting, that band keeps getting better all the time, but it's, yeah. it's our loss along the way. Today is National Garlic Day. And I can't let the day pass without mentioning uh, the greatest garlic dish ever invented is at Mona Lisa's, the restaurant on Water Street in Eau Claire. They do a roasted garlic tomato chutney appetizer with cambazola cheese that is life-changing. It's Chef Kiss? 
Yes. Oh, totally chef kiss. Uh, but by the way, you, you will the next morning be able to scrape the ooze off your cheek uh, from all that garlic and cheese that you've had. And uh, you may not you may not feel at your best, but you will totally say it was worth it. It's so good. Uh, today is also refresh your goals day, which is a kind of way of saying <laughs> you failed. You know, it's your New Year's resolution, but get back up, bucko. You can you can start over today. This is National Amaretto Day, National Poker Day, National Cat Lady Day, Dog Parent Appreciation Day, Greg. Happy yeah. day to you. Uh, National Hang Your Laundry Day and Sylvester the Cat Day, for some reason, from the cartoons. Coming up in our second hour, we'll talk to former U.S. Attorney Jim Santel. We'll also talk to Mark Jacob about this historic first week. Uh, former President Donald Trump on trial. Dan Schumacher will talk sports. We'll talk a little weather and more headlines coming.